After finally finishing my home renovation, I decided it was time to get rid of some old items. Among them was a rocking chair that had been in my family for generations. It was a beautiful piece, but it didn't fit with the new modern style of the house. I decided to sell it on Facebook Marketplace, hoping to find a new home for it. Within hours, I received a message from a woman named Lisa. She seemed very interested and asked if the chair was still available. After confirming that it was, we started talking about the details. Lisa seemed friendly and mentioned that she collected antique furniture. We agreed that she would come over the weekend to collect the chair. Everything seemed to be going well. Saturday arrived and, as agreed, Lisa showed up to get the chair. But she was not alone. A man, whom she had not mentioned before, accompanied her. He looked to be in his thirties, with a serious expression and a presence that made me feel uncomfortable from the first moment. I brought my husband to help me with the chair, Lisa explained, but something about the way she avoided direct eye contact made me suspicious. We entered the room where the rocking chair was. As Lisa examined the piece, the man began asking questions that made me uneasy. Do you live here alone? What time do you usually get home? Do you have a security system? I tried to deflect the questions, answering vaguely. Lisa, sensing the tension, intervened. Shall we discuss the price? She suggested, trying to lighten the mood. I agreed, wanting to end the conversation as quickly as possible. After a brief negotiation, they paid for the chair and left. The feeling of relief was quickly replaced by a persistent uneasiness. Something didn't feel right, and I couldn't shake the image of the man asking those invasive questions. Later that night, as I was getting ready for bed, I noticed a shadow moving outside the window. My heart raced. I turned off the lights and looked carefully through the curtains. The same car that Lisa and her husband used was parked across the street. Adrenaline rushed through my body. I stood still, watching the car. Minutes passed, but it felt like an eternity. Finally, I saw the car door open. It was the man, sneaking out and walking towards my house. I ran to the phone and called the police. As I waited, I noticed more movement outside. I looked again and saw the man sneaking through the bushes near the entrance. He seemed to be looking for something or someone. My heart was beating uncontrollably. Suddenly, I heard a noise at the back door. Someone was trying to break in. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed the sharpest knife I could find. My mind was a whirlwind of fear and adrenaline. I went back to the living room and heard heavy footsteps on the porch. The porch light came on. The man stood there, looking directly at the glass door, his face a mask of sinister intentions. He forced the handle, but it was locked. He began to push the door as the knocks echoed through the house. The police siren cut through the silence of the night, and the man fled to his car. They took off, disappearing into the darkness. I was still shaking when the police arrived, and I told them everything that had happened. Even after the police left, the feeling of safety was gone. Every noise in the night seemed louder than normal. I fell asleep only at dawn, but my sleep was disturbed by nightmares. I decided to move to a new apartment, looking for a place where I could feel safe again. I didn't post it on social media so I could be sure they wouldn't find me, and I also don't usually talk to strangers on these informal online sales apps anymore. My mother always had a knack for accumulating family heirlooms. When she moved to a smaller apartment, most of the old furniture stayed with me. Among them was a solid wood cabinet that belonged to my grandmother. It was an imposing, beautiful piece, but it took up a lot of space in my small apartment. So I decided to sell it. I advertised the cabinet on several websites selling used items and, a few days later, I received a message from a man named Oliver on Facebook. He seemed extremely interested and asked several details about the piece. 
He seemed to know a lot about antique furniture and demonstrated a kind of enchantment with the cabinet. Oliver offered to pick it up in person, and since he lived in the same city that made things easier, we arranged for him to come pick up the cabinet on Saturday afternoon. He said he would bring a truck and two assistants to help with the transportation, which made sense considering the size and weight of the furniture. Until then, everything seemed normal. However, something about Oliver's insistence and enthusiasm made me a little uneasy, but I shook off the feeling, believing I was being paranoid. On the appointed day, the clock showed 4 p.m., and the sun began to descend over the horizon, painting the sky with shades of orange and pink. When Oliver and his assistants finally arrived, I was surprised by their appearance. Oliver, a tall, thin man, had a constant smile that didn't seem genuine. The assistants, both corpulent and with closed faces, didn't say a single word. The uneasy feeling returned with a vengeance as they began to inspect the cabinet. At first, Oliver was polite, but soon the conversation took a strange turn. He insisted on seeing other furniture in the house, asking if I had any more antique pieces to sell. I said I was just interested in selling the cabinet, but he continued to insist, which started to make me uncomfortable. When I refused Oliver's insistence to come in and look at other furniture, I noticed a sudden change in his behavior. His smile faded, and his eyes took on a cold, calculating gleam. The two assistants, previously just silent observers, now stood threateningly near the entrance of the house. Look, I don't think you quite understand, Oliver began, his voice now devoid of any trace of warmth. We want to look at a few more things. Can you let us in? My response was firm, even though anxiety was beginning to build in my chest. No, I already said the cabinet is the only thing for sale. If you're not interested, we can end it here. Oliver took a step forward, and the assistants imitated the movement, further blocking the exit. The idyllic sunset seen outside contrasted sharply with the growing threat inside the house. I knew I needed to keep the door between us and them, and I tried to hide my nervousness as I looked for an excuse to end the interaction. Well, if you're not going to take the cabinet, I think you'd better leave. I have other commitments, I said, trying to sound casual. For a moment, I thought they would retreat. Oliver gestured to the assistants, and they backed away a little. But then, he looked at me with an expression that froze my blood. I guess we'll come back later to see if you've changed your mind, he said, before turning on his heel and leaving, closely followed by his assistants. I closed the door quickly and locked all the locks. What should have been a simple sales transaction turned into an ominous omen. I went to the window and saw the truck slowly driving away, but something about the way they looked back made me sure it wasn't the end. Night fell, bringing with it a feeling of vulnerability. Every little noise seemed amplified in the darkness. I tried to remain calm, but a constant fear that they would actually return kept me alert. Around midnight, I heard the unmistakable sound of glass breaking. I ran to my room, grabbed my phone, and called the police, explaining the situation in a low, urgent voice. As I waited, I heard heavy footsteps inside the house. The sound of drawers being pulled and objects being dropped confirmed my worst fears. They were really there. Fear paralyzed me for a moment as the noises in the house increased. I heard muffled voices, followed by the sound of furniture being dragged. They were looking for something, but what? I tried to take a deep breath and stay calm, remembering that the police were on the way. Time seemed to drag by as I listened carefully to each sound, trying to understand what was happening. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. My heart was beating so loudly I could hear it in my ears. I remembered my childhood hiding place in the guest room's built-in closet. I went quietly over there, trying not to make any noise, and huddled inside the closet, closing the door carefully. 
The voices became clearer as the intruders approached. Search the rooms, Oliver said, his voice full of cold determination. She must have hidden something of value. One of the assistants passed through the corridor, opening doors roughly. The sound of their footsteps echoed through the house. The guest room door opened with a bang, and I shrank further into my hiding place. The closet door was opened violently, and I found myself face to face with one of the assistants. He pulled me out, holding my arm tightly. I found her, he shouted, and Oliver entered the room, the evil smile back on his face. You shouldn't have made things difficult, he said, approaching slowly. Now let's take whatever we want. Desperate, I started to struggle, trying to free myself. I managed to land a kick on the knee of the assistant who was holding me, and he let me go for a brief moment. I took the chance and ran to the door, but Oliver was faster. He grabbed me by the hair and pulled me back, throwing me against the wall. The pain was intense, but the sound of sirens in the distance gave me a ray of hope. The police were arriving. Oliver looked out the window, realizing their time was running out. Go fast, he shouted to his assistants. They began taking what they could, filling bags with valuables. I curled up on the floor, trying to avoid any more pain. When I heard the doors to the house opening and footsteps running, I knew the police had finally arrived. Oliver and his assistants tried to escape, but the police were prepared and caught them before they could leave. The police officers helped me up and took me out of the house. Still shaking, I saw Oliver being handcuffed and placed in the squad car. The nightmare was finally over. The intruders were taken away by the police while I tried to process what had just happened. The house was in chaos, with furniture overturned and broken glass scattered across the floor. Despite the fear and confusion, I felt profound relief when I saw that the police had the situation under control. The officers took me outside, where I sat on the front step, still shaking. One of them, a woman with a compassionate expression, began asking questions about what had happened. I told her everything I could, from Oliver's initial message to the moment they broke in through the window. She listened intently taking notes and reassuring me that everything would be okay. Over time, investigations revealed that Oliver and his assistants were part of a gang specializing in stealing furniture and valuables. They chose victims through online sales advertisements, deceiving people like me with their apparent passion for antiques. I was looking for a cheap laptop on Facebook Marketplace so I could work from home. The recent crisis had tightened the budget, and the need to have decent equipment for my daily tasks had become urgent. I had been browsing the listings for a few days, comparing prices and talking to some sellers. Then I came across an ad that seemed too good to be true. A laptop in perfect condition, almost new, for a price well below the market. The salesperson, Aria, assured me that the device was in excellent condition and that the low price was due to the fact that she was moving to another country and needed to get rid of everything quickly. We chatted via text and Aria suggested we meet in a mall parking lot to make the exchange. It was a public and busy place which seemed safe to me. I agreed to meet her in the late afternoon right after work. That day, I asked my friend Emily to accompany me. She was always the voice of reason in my impulsive adventures, and although I didn't expect any problems, I thought it would be nice to have someone with me. When we arrived at the mall, I parked the car and waited for Aria. A few minutes later, I received a call from her. With a somewhat breathless voice, she explained that she had something unforeseen and asked us to meet in a further underground parking lot where it would be easier for her to solve a problem with her car. Emily gave me a suspicious look, but agreed to go. Curiosity and need took over, and I really wanted that laptop. We left the mall and drove to the new location. The underground parking lot was actually further away, and at that time of day, it was practically empty. 
The atmosphere was gloomy, with only a few lights flickering sporadically, creating dancing shadows on the concrete walls. I parked the car in one of the few lit places and turned off the engine. The darkness and oppressive silence of the place gave a feeling of vulnerability. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but something didn't feel right. I looked at Emily, who also looked nervous, and started to wonder if we should just leave. That's when I noticed movement in the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was a shadow play, but I soon realized that there was actually someone there, sneaking between the cars. The feeling of panic began to intensify. What should have been a simple exchange of equipment was turning into something much more sinister. As we waited, the restlessness began to turn into a great sense of danger. I looked around, trying to catch any suspicious movement. Emily, wide-eyed, suggested we leave immediately, but before I could respond, my phone rang again. It was Aria, but this time her voice sounded distant and disjointed. She said she was on her way, but there was something strange about the way she spoke, as if she were being instructed by someone. When I hung up, I began to notice other alarming details. More shadows moving between cars, figures hiding in dark areas. It was clear that we were not alone and that these people did not mean well. I decided it was time to get out of there, but when I tried to start the car, I realized it wasn't responding. The engine showed no sign of life. I couldn't understand why, but the car had been sabotaged. Emily started to panic, frantically whispering about calling the police, but my phone had no signal. At that moment, a figure emerged from the darkness, slowly approaching. He was a tall man with an impassive expression, as if he was used to causing fear. He introduced himself as Melvin, saying that Arya couldn't come but that he had the laptop. There was something extremely threatening about his presence, and his cold eyes never left ours. We knew we couldn't trust him. Trying to remain calm, I told Melvin that we were no longer interested and that we would leave. He gave a sinister smile and said it would be a shame to let a good opportunity pass by. Without wasting time, I grabbed Emily by the hand and we ran towards the parking lot exit. Melvin and the other figures began to follow us, their footsteps echoing in the emptiness of the place. We found an emergency door and pushed it open, stepping out into the cool night air. We ran to a nearby restaurant, panting and terrified. We walked in quickly, feeling a false sense of security under the bright lights and presence of other people. I borrowed a phone and called the police, reporting what had happened. A waiter came over and told us that there was a man outside, watching us. I looked out the window and saw Melvin, standing on the sidewalk, staring in our direction. When the police arrived, Melvin was missing. The officers escorted us back to the car, where they discovered the cables had been cut. They got us home safely, but the feeling of being watched persisted. Over the next few days, both Emily and I became extremely cautious, always looking over our shoulders. The image of Melvin and his cold eyes never left us. Maybe he was still watching us, waiting for the right opportunity to appear again. At the end of it all, I realized that the cheap laptop had become the least of my problems.